this lack of priestliness that is the burden of my heart tonight. I don't think it's any accident that we should both bear the same burden. I like the phrase Jesus Christ, prophet, priest, and king. The word priest is neatly sandwiched between prophet and king. I think there's some wisdom there. That somehow that priestliness is that quality that makes prophetic ministry possible and it leads to the attainment of the thing which is kingly. And probably the greatest lack in modern Christendom today, and probably nowhere more conspicuous, is this lack of a priestly sense in the charismatic and full gospel realm. There's a sense of brashness, hotshotism, Johnny come lately, quick and intemperate ministries that seems to offend something in my spirit, which I believe is the offense that I am experiencing in God's own heart. And maybe if you'll turn with me to Ezekiel, the 30th chapter, the 13th chapter, we might find some way to express what the Spirit is wanting to say. It's interesting that Ezekiel was also priest as well as prophet. And indeed, I'm just willing to say that there is no valid ministry of any kind except that the first a priestly ministry. Whether it's teacher, prophet, apostle, evangelist, we need to be priests unto God before servants unto men. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel that prophesy and say to them, that prophesy out of their own mind and heart, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, Woe to the foolish prophets who follow their own spirit and things they have not seen and have seen nothing. O Israel, your prophets have been like foxes among ruins and in waste places. You have not gone up into the gap or breaches nor built up the wall for the house of Israel that it might stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. They have seen falsehood and lying divination, saying, The Lord says, but the Lord has not sent them. Yet they have hoped and made men to hope for the confirmation of their word. Have you not seen a false vision? Have you not spoken a lying divination? When you say, The Lord says, although I have not spoken. Therefore, thus says, says the Lord God, Because you have spoken empty, false, and delusive words, and have seen lies, therefore, behold, I am against you says the Lord God. And my hand shall be against the prophets who see empty, false, and delusive visions, who give, and who give lying prophecies. They shall not be in the secret council of my people, nor shall they be recorded in the register of the house of Israel, nor shall they enter into the land of Israel. And you shall know and understand and realize that I am the Lord God. Because even, because they have seduced my people, saying, Peace, and there is no peace. And when one builds a flimsy wall, behold, these prophets daub it over with whitewash. Say to them who daub it with whitewash that it shall fall. There shall be a downpour of rain, and you, O great hailstones, shall fall, and a violent wind shall tear apart the whitewashed flimsy wall. Lo, when the wall is fallen, will you not be asked, Where is the coating with which you prophets daub it? Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I will even rend it with a stormy wind in my wrath. There shall be an overwhelming rain in my anger, and great hailstones in wrath to destroy that wall. So will I break down the wall that you have daubed with whitewash, and bring it down to the ground, so that its foundations will be exposed when it falls. You shall perish and be consumed in the midst of it, and you shall know and understand and realize that I am the Lord. Thus will I accomplish my wrath upon the wall and upon those who have daubed it with whitewash. And I will say to you, the wall is no more, neither are they who daubed it. The false prophets of Israel who prophesied deceitfully about Jerusalem, seeing visions of peace for her when there is no peace, says the Lord God. That's a hard text, and it's hard to be imagined that such a text can have any validity for this hour but I believe that it does. My great fear, and I hardly know how to express it, is something like this. That because something is 
scripturally true, doctrinally sound, that we without reservation accept it. And in fact, I believe that that is the very cause of some of the greatest <clears throat> reasons for the body of Christ being rent and ripped and torn in this present decade. It's not that God does not speak of discipleship or submission or authority or community or relationship. These are among the most sacred of God's principles. But for men to extrapolate principles from Scripture and make of them giddy systems, humanly engineered, is a formula for disaster. There's a time in God when he himself will quicken his own word for his own purposes. And there needs to be a priestly sense that will wait for that time. If there's anything that is consonant with true priesthood, it is the disposition in the heart of the priest to wait for the perfect timing of God. This morning in our prayer time, we were reminded of a precious brother, David Greenberg, some of you may remember from previous convocations from Wisconsin, who was with us on our last trip to Israel. And in the course of our days in Jerusalem, at the hotel, he came to us one morning, stricken in his faith, that God had spoken to him, that he was to bring his family and to establish his life in Israel. I can tell you that he had no natural qualification. In terms of chronological years of experience, he does not have many to boast. He's rather young in, in that sense in the Lord. But there's a certain quality of life that God has wrought in this man, in the obscurity of the place where God had established him in Wisconsin, that the Lord was now going to utilize. We had a right witness that this was indeed God's invitation. And we ourselves are extremely sensitive about those who think that they have an appointment to minister in Jerusalem because it's a jungle of self-appointed errant knights in their shining armor who have come to set things right whom God has not called. Something like what we've read in these scriptures tonight. Self-appointed prophets whom the Lord has not called. Speaking visions and lying words that he has not given them. Not that these men are evil. It's just that they're immature. It's just that they have wonderful intentions and they've grown up in a religious atmosphere that is so void of any priestly sense, in which the sense of that which is sacred has become so blunted that they don't know any better, and we poor saps who are their audiences applaud them because they recite from the scripture and speak things that are technical and true. God called a man in his 30th year. That is to say, the age of the coming forth of the priests the very age for which Jesus himself needed to wait before he began his own brief ministry and career which utterly transformed the earth. Not that he was not able when he was 21. Not that he did not have a grasp of scripture even in his teen years. Not that he could not earlier have made a very impressive splash. But there's something more than being a death in the word. There's something more than having a grasp of God's end time purposes. There's a certain working of God in obscurity in the lives of servants, of men who have come to a place before him in utter prostration, which is the posture of the priest, which it is utterly dangerous to ignore, especially in the sensitivity of these end days. God fingered this man in his 30th year, and he is now in Israel. And before he came and though he returned from Israel, within a matter of days he was able to sell his lumber business, his home, his property, packed up his belongings, came here for two days or so, spent some time with our fellowship, and we prayed for him and sent him forth with the anointing of oil on the very day of the 30th anniversary of the State of Israel. No one planned this. It just so happened to work out that that was the anniversary, Israel's 30th anniversary. And I pray that there's an anniversary somehow being commemorated in heaven for the spiritual Israel of God, that this is the year in which the priests are going to come forth in the body of Christ. Men appointed of God, who have waited in God, who have been faithful in the place to which he has called them, 
as was Zechariah himself, the father of John the Baptist, that though he was stricken with years and barren, he had not produced anything of note. His life was a reproach together with his wife, was one life with him. He was met in the exact moment of God by an angel at the right side of the altar who told him that his prayers had been heard and that God was going now to make him fruitful and that he was to be the father of John the Baptist who was himself to make ready the way of the coming of the Lord. There's something so precious about a priest being met at the altar by the angel of the Lord in the appointed moment. And even for such a detail as the right side, lest we moderns think that that is some kind of biblical flourish and that there aren't actual angels who meet actual priests in actual places and in actual times. There's such a heart in me to wait for that moment. And I'll tell you that it shall make all the difference if we do. Lest we find ourselves building walls that shall not stand in the day when storms come. And God's anger was directed at those who coated it with a whitewash that was seemingly in its appearance and attractive. But it was not the substance that would cleave to the wall and make it a steadfast kind of thing. But indeed the wall had fallen and there were great gaps in it. In which the blessings of God that had been imparted to the people of God would flow out. And the evils that were outside the camp would all the more flow in. There's a necessity for a wall to circle the spiritual Israel of God. But it has got to be made of tempered mortar and not some cheaper and more convenient stuff that is hasty and easy at hand that will give the appearance of tempered mortar, but which is not. I have no knowledge of the chemistry of mortar. I don't know the things that constitute its being tempered. But there's something about the word being tempered that makes my saliva roll. Tempered suggests a process. Tempered suggests something that requires time. Tempered suggests something that is of cost, which could be neglected and uh, done away with if we wanted a cheaper kind of quick plaster job. Tempered mortar is the thing which is absent. And the thing which will then expose the wall to the buffeting of the elements and in time will crumble it and bring it down. God says, you have not gone up into the gaps or breaches, nor built up the wall for the house of Israel, that it might stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. I don't want to sound like some kind of misanthrope that means a sour personality who finds things to be critical. And I want to say that it's precious to be encouraged. God knows. And there's a need for hospitality. And there's a wonderful uh, desire in the heart of God for right relationship among his people. But my fear is this, that somehow the mere reiteration of these things as principles or as formula will impress the people of God with a shallow kind of manner of adopting Things that will appear to be the reality and which are not. Can I tell you the kind of perverse character that I am? I'd rather not have my night table drawer stuffed with 130 birthday cards. There are people that I know that are in this room tonight with whom I have never had any kind of substantial conversation, though our lives have brushed continuously over the past four years or more. And I will not in myself initiate or seek to promote a kind of uh, convivial, jovial kind of thing that would seem to give the appearance of a true relationship. But I would rather wait in the timing of God for the circumstance, the hour, and the situation by which God will touch spirit to spirit in true relationship. You'll have to understand and hear more than these words and catch something between the lines lest we find ourselves as giddy kids going about establishing relationships and bringing iced tea to our neighbors and all the kinds of things that pass for impressiveness and fall short of the glory of the kingdom through a deeper working of God that is summed up in the word tempered for which we ourselves have not waited, not experienced, and have not known. And maybe we've not known it because there have not been priests to breathe upon us, 
that spirit of understanding that we have not the liberty to extrapolate ourselves the things of God out of the word and to adopt them as systems and make groovy little communities of uh, bright eyed uh, young men who are doing for each other and serving each other a miss is as good as a mile and there's a service and a quality of relationship in life which can only be caught up in the word kingdom which we shall not attain until we are first a kingdom of priests God is going to expose false foundations and you say Art, what is the true foundation that would have made the very same speaking edifying for the body and true building not an untempered whitewash but the true tempered coating of God that would enable walls to stand I don't know that I can quite articulate it or express it I don't know that my mind has yet come to understand it but it's something in my spirit that has eminently to do with the cross there's a certain process of death there's a certain something that comes in that prostration of winning before the God before God in the recognition of your own nothingness the knowledge that you're but dust and that you're prone to miss it that you that you're filled with tremblings as you stand be, before the behind the holy pulpit of God and speak to God's own people if that foundation is not there if there has not been that dealing of God if the Lord has not revealed the frailty of the servant if he's not shown him his vanity if he has not shown him the enormity and the magnitude of the offense that can be occasioned by his prematurity or his immaturity or his brashness or his superficiality that wall is not being built on a true foundation and God will expose it and bring it to naught that we might know that he is the Lord someone spoke something this morning in our fellowship about deception help me to remember it if I don't quite get it fully about the deceptions that will bring in and presently are working in Christendom that it will introduce evils among God's people in that the, there's a gap in the wall and I said I am more concerned not for the bringing in of apparent evil but for that bringing in of things that appear to be apparently good that speak of God and for God and about God but is not God I had to begin only a couple of weeks ago in a city in Missouri a one night's meeting in which God tracked people for things they would not otherwise have desired to hear in a hasty impromptu meeting that was not on our schedule so with the expediency of a phone call something was established for one night in this town in Missouri and the woman whose husband we called prepared a little publicity and put something in the paper when we arrived that afternoon they showed me the publicity I had to smile it made me to sound as if I was some kind of charismatic whiz kid some kind of charismatic darling in white shoes and, and holiday inn experience who, have, who was coming into town and was ready to bless the saints and indeed the saints came for that kind of blessing God tracked them they rented a room in a uh, trade building and we went to another room to pray don't ask me to explain this but I was experiencing again a kind of weakness that was so beggarly and left me so wan and so de devoid of strength that I had to sustain myself on the arms of my brothers in the football huddle of prayer that when that circle broke and I had not their shoulders to lean on I waved and sagged and near collapsed there was no natural way to explain that weakness it was not a natural weakness it was a voiding of any strength that I might have had in my own strength and personality my mind was numb I was bereft of inspiration I came into the room for the meeting it had begun some praises and choruses were going forth and finally the time came when I was introduced and I got up and I put on the microphone as I did tonight still in that same weakness and I looked out at the audience for like two or three minutes of painful silence to a people who had already been disposed to a certain tempo of charismatic life and were already restless for a silence that was not being filled. The sure mark they had no, that they had had no exposure 
to priestly ministry. But you find so titillating and exciting and has brought you into a new quality of relationship and a new appreciation for scripture, for praise and worship. What if I were to suggest that it is not the real thing? What if I were to suggest that a miss is as good as a mile? That you've got some kind of thing that appears to be it, but is yet not. That was the beginning of that night. And what followed afterwards was a kind of a blast of God out of heaven and about heaven. Some of you will be amused who know me and have not heard me speak on the subject of heaven, which is something of the past few months, that I am intoxicated with that subject. And that it was God breathing the spirit of heaven upon the very earthly charismatic crowd that absolutely devastated them that night. The priests were there, the nuns were there, and many of them found themselves on their faces, or some of them at least made such a motion, as God spoke horrendous, tearing, savage things to break down walls that had not a true foundation, and to reveal in the flaking away of the untempered mortar the cheap, flimsy kind of construction in which these saints till that night had been exalting. Can we kind of keep our finger in Ezekiel and turn to Hebrews for a kind of glimpse of the kind of priestly ministry that must proceed and be incorporated with that one who is prophet, evangelist, pastor, apostle, servant. The kingdom of priests that God is describing in Revelation is not in the order of Aaron. Chapter 7 in the book of Hebrews. I wonder if that's an accident. The seventh chapter. Perfect, utter completion. I've never had much sympathy either for the Aaronic order or the Melchizedek. Though strange to say, my own name, Katz, in his literal Hebrew translation, means priest of righteousness. The TZ ending of the word cats is from the family Tzadok, which God speaks of through Ezekiel in the 44th chapter as the one family that was faithful to him in the sanctuary, whereas the rest of the Levitical order went a hooring and, went and was seduced by the Greek spirit and departed from their priestly responsibility. God's gifts are without repentance, and they were allowed to remain in a kind of function as priests, but only at the door of the temple, and only in the hacking of animals. But they were not allowed to come before him and to minister unto him in the holy place. That was reserved only for the family of Zadok. And I think that in the scripture it says that as the priest, so also the people. You can measure the whole history of Israel, its rising and its falling, in exact accordance and conformity with what is the condition of its priesthood at any particular time. That's as true today as it was then. And what God gave us as a shadow in the fleshly ironic family, God brings to fulfillment in a higher order in the priest of righteousness and the, the king of righteousness and the king of Salem, Melchizedek. And I'm reading from the Amplified it says in the third verse, without record, without father or mother or ancestral line, nor with beginning of days and ending of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues to be a priest without interruption and without successor. In the eighth verse, furthermore, here in the Levitical priesthood, tithes are received by men who are subject to death, while in the case of Melchizedek, they are received by one of whom it is testified that he lives perpetually. In the 11th verse, now if perfection, that is, perfect fellowship between God and the worshiper has been attainable by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people were given the law, why was it further necessary that there should arise another and different kind of priest, one after the order of Melchizedek, rather than one appointed after the order and rank of Aaron? For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is of necessity an alteration in the law as well. 16th verse, 
referring again to the priest who arises and bears the likeness of Melchizedek, who has been constituted a priest not on the basis of a bodily legal requirement, an externally imposed command concerning his physical ancestry, but on the basis of the power of an endless and indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. There's something in these verses that has impressed me of what is the quality of this priesthood of which God is making a kingdom to reign on the earth that is different from and distinguished and other than the fleshly foreshadowing in the Aaronic priesthood which men were subject to death and were priests of another kind of law. The Melchizedek priesthood is a more sublime law and requires a more sublime priestliness. And the thing that is punctuated in each of, each of these verses is without interruption, resembling the Son of God, he lives perpetually on the basis of the power of an endless and indestructible life. And I think that this gets at the foundation which must be at the walls that shall be built, that shall not come down in the battle in the last day. Something about the eternality of God, a life that is endless, a life that is eternal, the power of the indestructible life, it is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And one of the statements that we've been making virtually in every place where God has brought us in these weeks is this, and you can discount it or just consider it. I believe with all my heart, and I may have said it in previous convocations, that the issue of the resurrection is the ultimate and final issue at the end of the age. Not the issue of whether we approve it as true, for who of us would not assent to the truth of the doctrine, but the issue of the reality and the knowledge of that life in the effectual daily walk of God's people. But I'll tell you that what distinguished the priest and established the priest was this, that on the day that the Levite stood by Moses and every man put on his side his sword, and went in and out of the camp, every man killing his own brother, his own friend, or his father, God said, on this day the Levites had been consecrated unto me as priests. You'll not be a priest if you're unwilling to draw blood. You're not, you'll not be a priest and serve in the priestly place if you're more concerned for decorum and not wanting to offend. There's something in the very nature of priesthood in its total commitment to God before him that of necessity almost always requires a measure of offense to men. It's a bloody, bloody calling. But I'll tell you that if it is not performed, Israel's plagues would not have been stayed. It's only a Phineas who took the spear and ran into the tent of the fornicating Hebrew and thrust him through with the woman from the land that stayed a plague. It was only an Aaron with the censer running in, standing in the gap between life and death that had already taken 17,000 of Israel that stayed the plague. It's a bloody calling, it's not a pleasant calling, and it's not a calling that's understood or appreciated, but if the plague is to be stayed, it needs to be performed. There's a certain leanness of soul that I be believe has been characteristic of certain days of this convocation. That might be suggestive of the kind of plague that I'm talking about. Every one of us has had occasion in our own spiritual walk to experience it. Whether here or elsewhere, choruses that have to be pumped up, repeated choruses, um, wearisome fleshly exercises to encourage a certain kind of so-called spirit of worship in order to prepare an atmosphere to produce a successful meeting. A certain kind of manipulation, a certain manner of speaking to saints, a certain kind of feigned humility, various other kinds of tactics and methods that we see practiced universally to produce a certain kind of effect that will stand for a successful meeting because there is already to certain measure plague in the camp, certain leanness of soul, 
because we have neglected the priestly ministration and we have sought to be teachers, prophets, apostles, worship leaders without first being priests unto God on the one basis alone in which it's possible the power of the indestructible and eternal life the Melchizedek priesthood in a word there's no ministry for any of us except in that utter prostration before God which was the posture of the Old Testament priest waiting before him in the knowledge and the assurance that of himself he was nothing and could do nothing are you willing to wait are you willing to suffer inexplicable silences I'll tell you that right now in this hour the presbytery of the Pentecostal movement in Yugoslavia is debating the question of whether our cat is to be allowed back in Yugoslavia to minister in their churches for essentially two offenses that were performed on the last time of ministry only some short months ago one was a night of ministry at the church of the head of the Pentecostal movement that was so exact and so right on and so pointed to the condition and need of that people that it was offensive God named names he spoke of the actual condition that was before him and not in the generality which we are so accustomed to hearing as in, this, in the hearing of sermons we've been so sermonized that our ears have become calloused we've heard so many true biblical messages that have not been pointed and direct and have made us its subject but spoken in rather general terms that we can either choose to receive or to ignore or to adopt in part but never the pointed word that says it's you that I'm speaking about of which Finney says that this is a fundamental if there's to be any kind of true revival God spoke that night in Yugoslavia in so pointed a manner and so accurately that that pastor believes that I had been put up to the message through the interpreter who was the head of the Bible school in that country and that I was pre-informed of the conditions and therefore I spoke out of human understanding an hour before the meeting I did not so much as have one syllable of understanding of what the subject was to be that night and dismissing myself from the time of coffee with that same brother who was to be the interpreter having spoken of many other subjects but not the meeting we went downstairs to his office myself Shelley Volk and Kyle Hill and we just prostrated ourselves before God and cried out in that priestly manner Lord what, how shall we presume to know what to speak or to do and in that time of prayer the Lord quickened something and on the basis of that which he quickened that we spoke it was so accurate that it was offensive and I'll tell you that before the speaking was over the blood had been splattered on the walls God did not spare them but he brought a very necessary and a sharp sword the second offense is like unto it that at one of the earlier meetings in yet another Pentecostal movement Kyle who was then at the pulpit had nothing to say and waited on God for 20 minutes before a jam-packed congregation I was sitting on the platform right alongside the head of that movement and I had almost to restrain him several times wanting to get out of his chair and to break the silence by doing something and the charge today is that individuals were coming from the local community who were not saved into the meeting and saw the terrible offense of Christians congregating together who were saying and doing nothing to serve in a priestly way is invariably to suffer offense is to be the instrument offense of offense and to bring upon yourself necessary reproach and I wonder if for that reason many of us especially those of us who are young and wanting to succeed and wanting to be bright lights in the firmament will not submit themselves to the necessity of coming into that priestly relationship on, in God waiting for their 30th year that they might be in his time met at the right side of the altar but instead will go off in their own animism in their own vitality and in their own cleverness not only to speak but to do things that are holy and to raise up a kind of wall that has the appearance of white but it is not tempered mortar and I say that storms shall come and winds shall blow 
And that stuff that is thin shall crumble away and expose the foundation of that wall, and the fall of it shall be great. We are already seeing such casualties in this hour. And I could name tonight leaders, charismatic leaders of the most impressive ministries in this country. In the forefront of discipleship movements and systems, whose tapes many of you might have in your possession, who are completely removed from God in this hour, having fled with the organist or Sunday school teacher or some such, having left behind wives and children in the most rash and impulsive kind of fleshly self-gratification, utterly contradicting every principle they espouse for the time of the, of the moment of their failure. You say, Art, what was wrong? Weren't they saying the right things? Yes, in a sense. And uh, were, wasn't their ministry an, uh, an encouragement and uh, uh, a blessing, I suppose? But somehow there was not a foundation. And when the wind and the storm of severe temptation trial came, they could not withstand it. Dear children, can I make a case tonight for the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Can I say that there's only one foundation for the will of God? It's his life. And can I say that there's only one kind of priesthood that shall establish a, the kingdom through a kingdom of priests before we are ministers, servants, prophets, teachers, apostles, and that is the Melchizedek priesthood, which is on the basis of the power of an endless and indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him you are a priest forever. Therefore he is able also to save to the uttermost completely and perfectly and finally and for all time and eternity those who come to God through him. Are you that kind of priest? Why then am I saying so often so many saved but few converted? Why is there so much shallow work in Christendom? Why so much flightiness and carnality? Where is that one who can save to the uttermost? The people had come up to you that night broken and repentant wanting to come into the kingdom of reality and truth as against the superficial kind of thing which they had been inducted through the shabby evangelism which is characteristic of our age egocentric, self-gratifying pandering only to the interests of men and the advantages that will accrue to you by believing could you have moved them from that kingdom to this? When you spoke of repentance did you speak of it in the power of the endless and indestructible life? Or is it a fad and a fashionable topic for our time? Do you seem in the speaking of things that pertain to repentance to be quite the substantial man of God? Or is it the theme that God himself has given you as you have prostrated and be stretched out and waited upon him as a dead man in the holy place? I'll tell you it'll make a very great difference, both the speaking and the response, if that is its origin. Dear children, there's not enough priestly ministry. There are too many self-appointed men. And there are too many men who are appointed of God, but have stepped out before the time to minister out of the light of their own life and understanding rather than the light of his life. In him was life, and his life is the light of men. Are you willing, dear priests or candidates, to come into that holy place of utter darkness, the obliteration of all cleverness and understanding, expertise and human eloquence, to be a mass of tremblings, utterly prostrate before God, devoid of any understanding and knowledge, and wait for the infusion of his life, and the tempering of your life, and the bringing forth of you in a serious year, for that priestly ministry that when you shall sound the note of repentance, it shall occasion a repentance that will save to the uttermost and not shallowly, but completely and perfectly and finally for all time and eternity. Is your ministry a ministry that has eternal consequence, or is it only temporal? Is it the kind of thing that will incite a little excitement for the hour, and a flush in the cheek of the saints, and will it soon be forgotten and dissipated as it was spoken? Or when you come to a place, will you be bringing an event as well as a message? When Jesus came as the Word made flesh, it was an event. When we come, it is so often only a message. True, biblical, sound, correct, a blessing. 
but there's no eternal change. We're not saved to the uttermost because only the Melchizedek priesthood is capable of leading men into that kind of salvation. It's on the basis of the indestructible life. By a priest who is a son who has been made perfect forever. The eighth chapter begins, now the main point of what we have to say is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. As officiating priest, a minister in the holy places, and in the true tabernacle which is erected not by man, but by the Lord. For every high priest is appointed to offer up gifts and sacrifices. And if then he were still living on earth, he would not be a priest at all. Don't you love the Amplified sometimes? If he were living on earth, he would not be a priest at all. The thing that distinguishes him as priest and that establishes him as priest in a ministry that saves to the uttermost is that he is seated at the right hand of the Father, the majestic God in heaven. Is that the origin of your place of ministry also? Are you willing to come to that prostration and utter voiding of yourself to obtain it? Is it your light or his light? Is it your life or his life? that is ministering? Is it your own clever appropriation of principles? Or is it his moment to himself single out that which is appropriate in his own wisdom for this hour and bring it forth by the power of his own life? They'll both be ministries. Uh, one will seem effective and be pleasant, but it shall not eventuate in saving to the uttermost and the other will because it was born in eternity, it had its origin in heaven, and its fruit also is heavenly and eternal. In a word, there's just not enough heaven about us. In a word, we're just too earthly. In a word, the only kind of priesthood that God will ex accept in this hour until the end of the age is that which is at the right hand of the Father in heaven. If then he was still living on earth, he would not be a priest at all. Where are you living? And what is the platform, the foundation, both of your life and your ministry? Do you have that sense that has been so lost and maybe we've never had it in modern times that was better known to the Old Testament saints? Because they saw a whole class of men raised up, descended from Aaron, who were virile men and able men, and men of considerable gifts, but who are not allowed to move in the ministry of their own lives until their 30th year. This is the 30th year of the anniversary of Israel. It's the age for the coming forth of the priest. I wonder if God is not now beginning to speak this theme of priesthood, seeking such a class of men for the body of Christ in this hour. This is a class of men who have no life in themselves, but their life as their ministry is in the power of the indestructible life. They know him in his resurrection. They speak out of it, and they can save to the uttermost those that come unto them. There are men whose ministry is unto God before it is ministry unto men. And if they speak on the subject of the fear of man, it is only out of the fear of God. And the fear of God as the holiness of God is only attained in one place. It's the holy place, the holiest place, where God will only allow those to come who are true priests unto him. Andrew Murray writes, What is it that I am to do when I am in the holiest? I am there to learn what worship is, to learn what it is to sink down into ever-deepening humility before God. There it is that I am to be clothed upon with the likeness and the spirit and the beauty of Jesus. There it is that I am to receive afresh every day the outflow and the inflow of the Holy Spirit from my beloved head. There is something lacking in the body of Christ. 
It is conspicuously absent in the full gospel and charismatic realm. It's the sense of priestliness of men who have waited before God and who are ever willing and ever disposed to wait. It is the posture of their souls continually before God who will not be brash, will not be clever, will not be successful, will not be man-pleasing, will not be able to say or to do except on the foundation of his own life who bring a fragrance of heaven in the priestly things that they minister to us. To bring us nearer to God is the great object of the priesthood, Andrew Murray writes. You know practically just as much or as little of the priesthood of Jesus as you have much or have little of the nearness of God. Someone made a comment in these days, so many references to the kingdom, but so little showing forth of the king. So much talk about relationship and adjustment and how-tos. How to establish the kingdom in relationship. But very little demonstration of the king. Can I say this? The kingdom is nothing more than the king writ large. And you're going to find yourself with a vacuous, empty kind of sponge candy, sponge sugar thing that has all of the appearances of the kingdom and is not. Because you have not indeed been brought to the king. But to men who have instructed you by technique and method how to. We've seen men in these past weeks of ministry left as trembling hulks on the ground when God has devastated them by kingdom messages that will completely require them to examine the whole of their life anew on the foundation of the kingdom of heaven. And their cry and their trembling was, how to? And we had no answer. Come before him in the holy place where the knowledge of the king is to be obtained. And there will be in that a working out of his life through you and in relationship that will be the establishing of the true kingdom. Dear children, it's not because I'm indifferent to relationships or that I'm making light of relationships that I'm speaking these things. It is because I am so insanely jealous of the relationships which are true that are not feigned, mimicked, imitated, superficially and humanly cordial. That too can the Rotarians do in the Elks and the Moose and the Masonic orders and all the rest. But there's a quality of relationship that is real, that has its origin in heaven, that bears the very fragrance of the King that can only be communicated by priests who will be willing to be voided of a human counterfeit and suffer the reproach of being without a sexual relationship and impressive kingdom appearance that they might find at the throne room what is the outworking of his life for that which is true, whose foundation is sure and shall not be devastated when the storms come. Bring us nearer to the king is the function of the priest. Teach my people the difference between that which is holy and that which is profane is the cry of God in Ezekiel 44. But it's not a matter of mere teaching. It's not a matter of a charismatic Bible study. It's the matter of the emanation of the very breath of that which is holy projected by men who have been in the holy place. I had a debate with a man by the name of Thomas Altizer some years ago a theologian at Stony Brook University who is one of the fathers of the God is Dead School of Theology. I never saw a more sad, pathetic man. It was hardly a debate at all. It was taking candy from a kid. He was just a man who was utterly spent. His life had caved in. He had no life. Utterly disillusioned. And only more recently, by the way, in that school where he taught, the day before that encounter, the students, 85% Jewish, had cohabitated and in an orgy right up to the doors of the elevator. You can picture rising snakes right through the floors of these co-ed living dorms. You have a sense of what is happening to Jewish middle class youth today. Little wonder that my heart was stabbed when I just came back from Holland and visited Amsterdam with John van der Hoven to visit the, the center of prostitution and pornography and to see these enormous 10-foot cut-out red plastic figures of copulation in every kind of imagined form, filth so despicable that it cannot be described, 
that it will smite your eyeballs blocks before you enter the section. The most degrading kind of filth, it is the Sodom and Gomorrah of Europe, as are the great cities now of Europe, one by one fallen casualty. Civilizations much older, much braver, much more noble than ours, falling like that within the space of a decade or less under the terrible winds and storms of filth and depravity that are blowing over the earth, unable to resist. We went to a little stuccoed chapel right there in the midst of that filthy center, having just come from a conversation with three Jewish kids with packs on their back, one from Canada and two from Israel who met together seeking for answers for their distraught life, and there in that filthy section. And the woman in the chapel said, Archie said, do you know that this section that has become famous throughout the world for its vice and filth was formerly the area that was inhabited by the Jewish people before Hitler came? This was the Jewish neighborhood. And when Hitler removed the Jews who had some sense of the law of God, some sense of the righteousness of God, the thing was, the vacuum was immediately filled by what you now see. There needs to be a restoration of a sense of holiness. There needs to be something of the breath of heaven breathed upon God's people. I don't care in what kind of ministry, whether it's the prophet, whether it's the teacher, whether it's the apostle, whether it's the worship service, whether it's giving the simplest instruction, whether it's taking an offering. There needs to be a fragrance of heaven. There needs to be a sense, there needs to be a sense of priestliness by those who have met him in that holy place. Let Jesus be our High Priest, the minister of the sanctuary, opening heaven to our hearts, the mediator of the covenant, opening our hearts for heaven to enter in and to fill them. What is all this to end in? What is the object of all this? Is it that I am to live in God's presence, that I may be very happy and very holy? No. These things are but the means to an end. What is it then? It is that I, like Christ, should also be a priest. You could not be a priest in biblical times except you were a son of Aaron. You had to be descendant by the life. It wasn't something that you could appoint for yourself. You inherited it by life. And the same thing is true now. It is only by life that you can wear this kind of mantle and enter into that holy place. In the power of the indestructible life, the resurrected one, the King of Glory, the Lord of Heaven, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ. Are you in that life and living from that life and ministering from that life? Have you waited for that 30th year? And having found it, are you willing ever and always again to wait? Even in the standing before God's people and in crucial times, suffering the embarrassment of silence, which will ironically keep you from a country that doesn't need anything more desperately than the heavenliness of God, whose very Pentecostal movement is so pathetic in its condition that they cannot even recognize God in these dealings and were offended by them. How many of you perhaps are offended tonight by, by such a word as this? Think it a breach of taste to make allusion to ministries that have already been expressed from this pulpit. But I'll tell you that greater issues than taste are hanging in the balance this night and in this hour. And if you have no stomach for blood, and you'll not take it upon your hands, you avoided one of the essential qualifications for priesthood. Consecration means blood in the hands. The one who is willing to strap the sword in the side and go in and out of camp, and every man slay his friend, his brother, that the plague will be stayed. Has this made any kind of sense? Did I make a mistake? Should we have allowed you to go with the sweet, euphoric sense that comes at the end of days of camp together? Was it an ungainly thing to introduce this kind of a note? The foundation, the reference to a foundation that has to do with death, that has to do with a cross which is so little mentioned in modern day preaching and teaching. I can't see any flight greater 
among Christians today than the flight from the cross. We're guilty of an avoidance of suffering in any form. We just don't like it. Can we have happy, uh, hail, well, uh, times of backslapping and fellowship? Does there have to be ungainly intrusions? Do we have to suffer? The awkwardness and other things that they introduce? Are we willing to be processed and be ourselves tempered by the only means which God will himself produce it through conflict and through suffering? Are we willing to lay aside a premature ministry and give ourselves to a dealing of God in obscurity that he can bring us forth as tempered ministers who will build walls that shall not collapse and temper them with tempered mortar that shall stand because we ourselves are tempered having waited upon him in the holy place? Will we be a people who will not be impressed with appearances? Will we not be quick to give assent and amens because something is merely technically true or scripturally sound? But wait also for the witness of the life. Will we be a people who can save others to the uttermost? Who come to God through us? Now this is the main point of which we have to say. We have such a priest. We ought to be such a priest, one seated at the right hand of God in heaven, an officiating priest, a minister in the holy place, the true tabernacle of God. So will you bow your head with me tonight? Many of us, or some of us, who have been victims ourselves of premature systems of discipleship, of being submitted to men who unfortunately were only mere men. The bruises and the hurts, the wounds that are in the body of Christ tonight for the immaturity and the prematurity of men in ministry flashy systems, glib, cute, unctuous, little communities of happy doers. It's good, but it falls short of the glory. This kingdom shall not come on the earth except it be introduced by priests of the kingdom. May something have been communicated to your souls by this kind of expression tonight. So precious God, we thank you, Lord, for the sounding of the theme. We know that it needs so much more to be understood, to be discussed. And maybe the reason that we've not heard more of it is that it just not does, it does not lend itself to Bible studies, but only somehow to the experience of those who are willing to come to places of utter prostration in the holy place. So we just pray for the young men and women, Lord, especially who are in this congregation tonight. That something of the spirit of the speaking has been infused in their own souls. That something of the sacredness, the holiness of God, the respect for God, for his time, for the things that come into six months, for the angel that will meet us at the right side of the altar in that perfect moment, though we've been stricken with years and barren and unfruitful. May something of that be communicated in the lives of these young people who shall be willing to wait. Precious God, restore to the body of Christ the Melchizedek priesthood. Have for yourself priestly ministers, priestly prophets, priestly apostles, priestly ministers, men covered with blood for themselves first, conscious of their own iniquity, 